In this lecture, we're going to look at one of my favorite topics in differential equations, which is the study of bifurcations. So the definition of a bifurcation, if you look it up in the dictionary, it means a division into two branches. In mathematics, when we say bifurcation, we mean that we've made a change to our system through, say, a parameter that's caused a qualitative change in the behavior of the system. So in particular, if we're looking at some model and we have a parameter in our model, shifting our parameter may cause new equilibria to appear, other equilibria to disappear, this kind of qualitative change to what we observe when we look at our model. In this lesson, we're not going to look at any applications, so we won't have any population models or anything like that. We're just going to look at first order autonomous differential equations all of them will be for dy dt. So y is the dependent variable, t is the independent variable. And then in the right hand side, we'll have this parameter mu. So what we want to do is take an equation like this one, dy dt equals mu minus y squared, adjust the parameter mu. For example, on this page, we're going to look at five different values of mu and see how changing that parameter affects what we conclude about the system. We'll take our conclusions and organize them in something called a bifurcation diagram. And then once we look at a bifurcation diagram, you'll see why this definition of division into two branches makes sense. So why we use this word bifurcation to study how adjusting a parameter might affect a differential equation. Okay, so what we're going to do is take this differential equation and create phase lines for five different values of mu. So let's first suppose that mu equals negative four. If mu equals negative four, then our equilibrium solutions satisfy negative four minus y squared equals zero. In other words, y squared equals negative four which doesn't have any real solutions. So if mu equals negative four, we don't have any equilibrium solutions. So that means that our phase diagram is going to be pretty simple. All I'm going to do is draw an arrow either pointing us to the left if the differential equation indicates that y decreases over time or to the right if y increases over time. Well, notice if mu is negative four, dy dt equals negative four minus y squared would always be negative. So our phase diagram is simply an arrow pointing us to the left. Okay, let me copy this phase line now for the other four values of mu. Okay, what happens if mu equals negative two? Well, if I plug negative two into the right-hand side of this equation and look for an equilibrium solution, I would like to find a value of y satisfying y squared equals negative two. Once again, there's no solution to that, no real solution. And moreover, for all values of y, dy dt is negative. So this phase line looks the same as the one above. So as we adjusted our parameter mu from negative four to negative two, nothing changed. We didn't see any qualitative change in the behavior of this differential equation. But what happens now if mu equals zero? If mu equals zero, then dy dt equals negative y squared. Let me write y prime equals negative y squared just so that we can look at it. That means that there's an equilibrium solution at zero. Okay, so we've gone from no equilibrium solutions to picking up an equilibrium solution. That's a change in our system. To fill in the details for the rest of the phase line, notice that whenever y is not zero, negative y squared is negative. So zero is a node. Okay, let's see what happens now if I increase mu from zero to one. In this case, we're looking at the differential equation y prime equals one minus y squared. Again, we're going to see a shift in the qualitative description of this system. It's going to go from having one equilibrium solution to having two. The two equilibrium solutions are located at plus and minus one. 
All right, then what happens if we're less than negative one? If y is smaller than negative one and we square it, y squared is bigger than one. So one minus y squared is a negative number. And that would also be true if y was greater than one. If y is between negative one and one, like zero, for example, then y prime is positive. So this is our phase line. Okay, so we can say a little bit more about how our system has changed. As we increase from mu equals zero to mu equals one, we went from one equilibrium solution to two, and our node kind of split into a source and a sink. Okay, let's finish with mu equals four. That means y prime equals four minus y squared. Once again, we're gonna have two equilibrium solutions, this time at negative two and two. And then if we do our signs check, it's going to be the same as the line above. So if y is either smaller than negative two or greater than two, y prime is negative. Whereas if y is between those two values, it's positive, y prime is positive. So we haven't had a real change in our system from mu equals one to four. We still have two equilibrium solutions and they're a source on the left and a sink on the right. Okay, so this demonstration gives us a picture of how changing our parameter mu led to a change in the system from no equilibrium solutions to exactly one to a source and a sink. We like to organize this information in what's called a bifurcation diagram. And what we're gonna do is take these horizontal phase lines that I've drawn and flip them vertically. Because we're gonna think of mu as like an independent quantity that we're shifting, and we wanna see how the system changes in response to mu. So we'll put mu on the horizontal axis, and then we'll organize the y and dy dt information vertically. So to the right of my lines here, let me create five vertical lines. Now left to right, we wanna put these in ascending order for mu. So on the left, we have mu equals negative four, and then we move all the way to the right and finish with mu equals four. Now I'm going to plot my equilibrium solutions on these lines. I don't have any on the first two lines, but there's one at y equals zero when mu equals zero. So I'll put that node there. And then on the line mu equals two, we get the two at plus and minus one. And then when mu equaled four, we had two again at plus minus two. Then I'm going to draw the arrows down if dy dt is decreasing, so it's like this. And then up if dy dt is increasing. Okay, so that's how we take our phase lines, which in the past we've drawn as horizontal lines and flip them vertically so that mu is being organized along what you think of as like the horizontal direction and the information for y and dy dt we're picturing vertically. In MATLAB, I created this bifurcation diagram focusing on the regions where we saw the change. So here we have the mu axis here we have the y-axis. There were no equilibrium solutions for mu less than zero, so I don't have any dots over here. And then we had an equilibrium solution at y equals zero when mu equals zero, and then plus minus one when mu equaled one, plus minus two when mu equaled four. And then to kind of give the curve a little bit more shape, the curve we're about to imagine, I also put in here what happens at mu equals two that would be like plus minus square root of two. So you can see that we're looking at a, essentially a horizontal opening up to the right parabola. So we can imagine, you know, if we drew like other lines, where would we see those equilibria? We would see them here. So we can connect them now to draw a top branch and a bottom branch. And then for stability, we know that we're traveling down at that node when y equals zero. Also traveling down over to the left. There's no real great way to indicate that because I don't have any vertical lines, but we'll just do that. And then we go like this, kind of above and below the parabola, we travel down. 
and then inside the shape we're going to be traveling up. What that means is that this top branch of the parabola is a branch of sinks. And the bottom branch of the parabola is a branch of sources. And then of course right at the origin we have a node. So with our bifurcation diagrams what we would like to do is take perhaps a few phase lines that we've created for explicit values of mu and extend them so that we get a picture that's essentially a more continuous representation of how shifting mu through every value from 0 to 1, 1 to 2, etc. would cause the system to behave. I created that picture in MATLAB, so this is a bifurcation diagram for the system. The top branch here, I've colored it green, and the bottom branch I've colored red. Not everybody can distinguish those two colors, so let me label them as well. So this is a branch of sinks. This is a branch of sources. And then of course we have a node at the origin. Coloring the branches is pretty common. Sometimes people will try to indicate the difference in, in whether or not it's a sink or source, stable or unstable, using thickness. So maybe the top one for sinks, we can make it a little bit thicker. And then sometimes in bifurcation diagrams, people might even color the regions around them to indicate the stability properties. So here, again, where we're traveling to the left, our differential equation was decreasing whenever mu was negative. The differential equation told us that y would be a decreasing function. And then we get that node at y equals 0, and then after that we can see what's happening. So if we're up here, if y is the solution to our differential equation and it lives up here in the first quadrant of the mu y plane, we would expect to decrease down towards the sink right here. If we were here, we would increase up towards that sink. If we were here, we would decrease down. Bifurcations have different names based on the different shape they take. This one, where it looks like a parabola, is called a saddle node bifurcation. So it's like there's a kind of saddle shape right where you have a node and you get your bifurcation. Okay, let's take a look at this example. We would like to construct the bifurcation diagram for y prime equals y squared minus 2y plus mu, or dy dt equals y squared minus 2y plus mu. In the previous example, what we did was we just grabbed a few values of mu and saw how the phase lines looked. This time we're going to do it a little bit more wisely. So regardless of what the value of mu is, let's see if we can come up with an explicit form for the equilibrium solutions. So equilibrium solutions exist when y prime equals 0 for all t. In other words, it's a value of y for an autonomous differential equation that makes the whole right-hand side equal to 0. Notice the right-hand side is a quadratic equation for y. So we can write y squared minus 2y plus mu equals 0. And then for special values of mu that might factor, but for any value of mu, we can look for the solutions with the quadratic formula we get that y equals 2 plus or minus the square root of negative 2 squared minus 4 times 1 times mu all over 2. We can simplify that. So in particular, we have 4 minus 4 mu inside the square root. So if I factor that 4 out, it turns into a 2. So I can say that this is 2 plus or minus 2 times the square root of 1 minus mu all over 2. And then we can cancel out those 2's and we're left with 1 plus or minus the square root of 1 minus mu. This quadratic equation yields at least one solution whenever mu is less than or equal to 1. 
If mu is greater than one, then we don't get a real number when we plug that into this quadratic expression here. So there would be no equilibrium solutions whenever the parameter mu is larger than one. Okay, that gives us different values of mu that we should test in order to put together a qualitative analysis of how this differential equation changes as mu changes. So in particular, we have different scenarios. Let's first consider the possibility that mu is larger than one. We're gonna to put together a phase line and I'll continue to draw my phase lines horizontally in this example, then we'll flip them vertical. And then after that, we'll just do vertical. Okay, if mu is greater than one, then we don't have any equilibrium solutions. So if I come up here to my differential equation, I just need to figure out if it's always positive or always negative. And it's enough to do that at say y equals zero. So if I'm looking at a solution to this differential equation and I plug in y equals zero, at that moment, y prime is mu, which is positive, now, since we don't have any equilibrium solutions, we don't ever have a sign change. So the differential equation is always positive, which means on our phase line, I'm gonna draw an arrow to the right. And that tells us that any function y satisfying this differential equation with mu greater than one increases over time. Okay, what happens if mu is exactly one? If I plug one into the quadratic formula over here, the square root part is zero. So we have an equilibrium solution right at y equals one. That's our only equilibrium solution in this scenario. And now we need to figure out the signs of dy dt to the left and to the right of this equilibrium solution. So what happens if y equals zero? Plug zero into this equation, we're left with mu. Mu is one. So that means to the left, we're increasing. What if y is larger than one? If I plug in say five, we get 25 minus 10 plus one, that's dominated by that 25. So this is a node. We have a node here at y equals one. And we observe a bifurcation. So as our parameter went from larger than one to exactly one, we went from no equilibrium solutions to the existence of one. Now let's see what happens if mu is less than one. If mu is less than one, then we have two distinct equilibrium solutions. One at one minus the square root of one minus mu, the other one at one plus the square root of one minus mu. So there are two equilibrium solutions and they're equidistant from y equals one. So on my phase line, let me draw them kind of centered around that node that I have on the middle, middle scenario. Okay, so the one on the left is one minus the square root of one minus mu, and the one on the right is one plus the square root of one minus mu. Okay, let's consider what happens to the right-hand side of our differential equations in the three different zones that this phase line creates. Imagine that we're to the left over here. You could pick something kind of extreme like y equals negative a thousand, you square that and that's gonna be the dominating term on the right-hand side here. So negative 1,000 squared minus two times negative 1,000, that's another large number, plus mu, mu could be something like zero. Overall, this is positive. And same story actually on the right. So if you test kind of extreme values there, you're gonna get that that differential equation is positive. What about if y is say one, that's right in the middle between these two equilibrium solutions. We get one minus two, so that's negative one, plus mu, but mu is not as large as one. So we stay negative, so we draw an arrow to the left. Okay, so the node that we observed at mu equals one has now split into a sink on the left and a source on the right. To imagine this phase portrait now flipped vertically, it might help to tilt your head to the left. So like put your left ear on your left shoulder. That way mu is in ascending order. So we would, we would draw this one down here on the bottom first. So that's a smaller value of mu and then increase mu up to one. 
and then increase mu up to larger than one. We flip it, this is what we get. So here we see the creation of the node at mu equals one, and then it splits. To the right of one, there were no equilibrium solutions. Let's fill in now the stability. The differential equation was increasing around the node right at one. And then it was increasing, decreasing, increasing. So that the smaller equilibrium value down here was always a sink and the upper one was a source. Okay, so I had MATLAB generate the beginning of this picture, but if you're doing this by hand, this is the idea. You organize your phase lines vertically. You fill in enough sample examples in order to get the big picture. And then you realize the shape that must be taking place here. Then we can say that the top branch is a branch of sources. and the bottom branch is a branch of sinks. So that's how you could sketch this bifurcation diagram for this equation by hand. And if you put it all into MATLAB, this is what you might generate. It looks a lot like the bifurcation diagram that we already saw. Let me flip back to that. It's a little bit different from this one. Here, our sinks are on the bottom branch and we're opening to the left, but this is also a saddle node bifurcation. We have our thicker branch of sinks down here and our branch of sources up at the top and then we have a node right at mu equals one. Okay, we have a new example. So we want to construct the bifurcation diagram for dy dt equals mu times y minus y squared. Now, similar to the last example, what we're going to do is look for what the equilibrium solutions would have to look like in terms of mu. So in particular here, if we factor out the y, we get y times mu minus y. So that means that we have equilibrium solutions whenever y equals zero or y equals mu. If mu equals zero, then we only have one, otherwise we have two. Okay, so I think what we should do is consider three cases, mu less than zero, mu equals zero, and mu greater than zero. So let's consider mu less than zero first. Then if we draw our phase line, we're going to have two equilibrium solutions with a value of mu on the left and zero on the right. Okay, what happens if y is to the left of mu? Well, if we look at the factored form of our right-hand side, if y is less than mu and mu is less than zero, then that leading term of y is negative, but mu minus y is going to take a negative number and subtract off another negative number, it's gonna be larger, right? So if mu is negative one and y is negative two, negative one minus negative two is positive. So overall, the product that we get on the right-hand side is negative, that puts us in the direction going to the left. On the other hand, if y is between mu and zero, then again, that first term is negative, but now the second term is also negative, so the product is positive. So to capture that, we're gonna draw a little arrow going to the right. Now, if y is greater than zero, that first term is positive. Mu is negative minus y is also negative, so we get positive times negative and overall the sign tells us that we're going to the left. Okay, so if our parameter mu is negative, we have two equilibria. The one on the left at mu is a source and the equilibrium at zero is a sink. Okay, if mu equals zero, then that means that we have exactly one equilibrium solution right at zero. If we go back to the original form of our differential equation at the top, if we plug in mu equals zero, we see that the right-hand side is negative y squared. So both to the left of zero and to the right of zero, 
negative y squared is negative. So what we have is a node. Okay, now what if mu is positive? That's our remaining situation to consider. Once again, we have two equilibrium solutions, but this time zero is on the left and mu is on the right. Now if y is to the left of zero, that leading y in the factored form of our differential equation is negative, but mu minus y is mu minus a negative number, so overall that's positive, that means that we're traveling to the left. If y is between zero and mu, we're going to have positive times positive, so we'll be traveling to the right. And then if y is greater than mu, we have positive negative, so once again we're traveling to the left. Okay, to piece together what this bifurcation diagram is going to look like, let's think about plotting it in the mu y space. So I'll put axes here where mu will be on the horizontal axis and y will be on the vertical axis. Then for every situation y equals zero is an equilibrium, that's like saying that entire mu axis is an axis of equilibria. And then similarly, for every value of mu, y equals mu is an equilibrium. So y equals mu is a straight line through the origin that's going to give us another line of equilibrium solutions. Now to determine the stability, let's imagine that we fix a negative value of mu. That corresponds to our first scenario, what if mu is less than zero? In that scenario, mu was a source. So let me do a down arrow and an up arrow. So in the left half of this picture, that line y equals mu is going to give us a line of sources. So that ray coming out of the origin pointing down to the third quadrant is a, is a ray of sources. And then the mu axis value is going to be a sink. So to finish the stability portrait, let me draw an arrow going down. Okay, so we can see also that the negative mu axis is a ray of sinks. And then right at the origin, when these two equilibrium solutions coincide, we have just a node. Do down and down. And now in the first quadrant, they switch roles if you're looking at the lines. So y equals mu, that ray pointing up into the first quadrant, that's going to become a ray of sinks. So in other words, if I imagine fixing a value of mu, we have down, down, and then between the two equilibrium up. So now y equals mu is the sink, and the mu axis value y equals zero is a source. Here's this bifurcation diagram done in MATLAB. Let me highlight here the sinks. So we have the mu axis in the left half plane, and then y equals mu up in the first quadrant. So these are sinks, sinks, and then the rest of them are sources. And then our bifurcation happens at the origin where we have a node. Now this bifurcation diagram looks different than the ones we've seen so far. Those were saddle node bifurcations. This is an example of what's called a transcritical bifurcation. So we had two equilibria to the left of the origin, two equilibria to the right of the origin. They coincided right at the origin and there they essentially exchanged stability. Okay, let's make the bifurcation diagram now for y prime equals mu y minus y cubed. This is going to give us a new type of bifurcation, neither saddle node nor transcritical. So this is going to be a new form. And once again, what I'm going to do is start by trying to find the equilibria for the right-hand side in terms of mu. So let me factor out y. So we can write the right-hand side of the equation as y times mu minus y squared. So y equals zero is always an equilibrium solution. And then the existence of other equilibrium solutions depends on the sign of mu. 
if mu is positive, then mu minus y squared gives us two more, square root of mu and negative one times the square root of mu. If mu equals zero, we continue to have just one, because y squared equals zero and y equals zero just gives us one big equilibrium at zero. And then if mu is negative, mu minus y squared won't give us any additional roots. So once again, let's break our analysis up into three categories. We'll start with negative mu, then mu equals zero, then mu greater than zero. Let me copy over now the setup from the previous example. So in the first situation, if mu is negative, then we have exactly one equilibrium solution at the origin. Notice if mu is negative, then mu minus y squared is also negative. That's negative minus positive, so overall negative. So then if y is also negative, that leading factor, we get negative times negative is positive. But if y is positive, we get positive times negative is negative. Okay, so zero is a sink in that situation. If mu equals zero, we still just have one equilibrium solution at the origin, but it may no longer be a sink because it looks a little bit different now on the right-hand side. Okay, on the right-hand side, if I plug in mu equals zero, we get negative y cubed. So if y is negative, then a negative number cubed is negative times negative one is positive, so we would move to the right. And then if y is positive, negative y cubed is negative, so we would move to the left. Okay, so it turns out nothing actually changed from situation one to two, but of course that was a threshold value from mu, so you do wanna make sure you check that. And then if mu is greater than zero, we pick up two additional equilibrium solutions. So in addition to the equilibrium solution at zero, we also have plus minus square root of mu. For this one, what I'm going to do to analyze the signs on the right-hand side is recognize that cubic shape that we get from mu y minus y cubed. What we found is the roots of that cubic. So that's a cubic polynomial with negative cubed coefficient, negative one in front of the y cubed term. So that means that the shape of the cubic polynomial is going to look like this. So if mu is positive and I graph that cubic, mu y minus y cubed, I would get a cubic polynomial that goes up to infinity as we travel to the left and down to negative infinity as we travel to the right. Okay, so that means that our signs have to go positive, negative, positive, negative. So now the equilibrium solution at zero has changed. It's no longer a sink, it's now a source. And then our two new equilibria are sinks. Okay, so let's graph this again. Copying this over from before, once again, the mu axis is an axis of equilibrium solutions because y equals zero is always an equilibrium. And then if we think about mu minus y squared, that's going to be a parabola that opens up to the right. So that looks like this. In the left half of the plane, the equilibrium solution at zero is a sink. And in fact, we can also do that on the y-axis. So let me draw an arrow going down and an arrow going up to indicate that the origin in this picture is a sink. We can also put in some sample values of mu, so to the left and to the right, where we can draw our arrows. The one on the left is again a sink. And then what happens is we go like this. So you can see how the downward motion in the upper half plane kind of goes up above the parabola. And similarly, the upward motion in the lower half plane goes down below the parabola. And then to fill in the picture, it looks like this and this. Okay, so the sink that we had on the axis, the mu axis, as we travel left to right, splits into this parabola, which let me highlight that that's a parabola of equilibrium solutions. So our sink splits into two, and then what lives between them, which is now on the mu axis in the right half plane, becomes a source. Here's the picture in MATLAB, and you can see that this is appropriately named a pitchfork bifurcation.
So let me highlight our sinks. And then what's in the middle of that parabola is the source. So our single equilibrium splits into three. This is a new type of behavior that we haven't seen yet. Okay, let's finish with this example. We want to construct a bifurcation diagram for dy dt equals f of y plus mu, where f of y is this cubic shape function that I've sketched here. It's not really important that it's symmetric or anything like that because the analysis we're about to do, this kind of visual determination of what the bifurcation diagram has to look like, doesn't depend on it being an odd symmetric function. Okay, what I'm gonna do is go ahead and sketch the bifurcation diagram to the right for different values of mu. Notice if mu equals zero, then dy dt equals f of y is just the picture on the left. So that means that we have three equilibrium solutions corresponding to the three roots of this graph. So one's at the origin, and then there's one above and one below. Now what happens if I take mu and I increase it a little bit? The effect on our picture is a vertical translation. So if I wanted to add mu to this cubic shape, what I would imagine doing is shifting this graph up like this. It might be easier instead of shifting the entire graph up to think of shifting the axis, the x-axis down. That's just because it's easier to draw a straight line than a cubic shape. So now what's happened is that my equilibrium that was here at positive y has shifted a little bit to the right, the one at zero has shifted towards the left, and the negative one has shifted up a little bit. So following that order in our picture, the top one goes up a little bit, zero comes down a little bit, and the negative one goes up a little bit. Now let's do the same thing, but I'm gonna shift mu a little bit more so that the graph on the left half of the plane is tangent to the x-axis. Okay, so this is like plus a larger value of mu. So if I add that to my bifurcation diagram, it's gonna look like this. What happens here is that our top one shifts up a little bit. That moved even further to the right, but now the two equilibrium solutions down below have collided, let's say about here. Okay, and then if I increase the value of mu, we're going to completely lose those equilibrium solutions down at the bottom and we'll just have the one at the top. So for a larger value of mu, all we have is just one equilibrium solution up here. Okay, let's go the other direction. Okay, now subtracting off a value from f of y is like raising the x-axis up visually in our picture. So if we imagine a negative value of mu and see what's happened to our starting roots, the one on the left has gone down a little bit. The one at the origin has become a little bit positive, but then the rightmost one has gone a little bit to the left. So those have moved closer together. Again, I can shift up so that they coincide now we just have two equilibrium solutions here and here. And then if I increase mu a little bit more, only the one on the bottom survives. The top ones have completely gone away. I realize now I should have been doing the stability analysis at the same time, so let's fill this in. We'll start here and then go backwards. Keep in mind here that this axis I've drawn up kind of high is giving us the roots of f of y plus mu. That's the right-hand side of our differential equation. So if we're on the left, that means the quantity f of y plus mu is above the axis, so it's positive, versus if we're anywhere on the right, it's negative. So that means the single equilibrium solution we have must be a sink. For y values to the left, it increased, and for y values up above, it decreased. 
Okay, let's go to our next vertical line on our diagram. Once again, if y is very far negative, dy dt is positive because we're up above f of y plus mu equals zero. So we still have a positive up arrow down here. And now what's happening is that our single equilibrium solution on the right half of the picture is a node, but similar to the previous example, anywhere else on that right half, we would go down. So that becomes a node. Next one, we see we would increase, decrease, increase, decrease. Because here dy dt is positive, negative, positive, negative. So that's going to be like increase, increase in that little region in there, decrease, decrease. Same story for where we started, positive, negative, positive, negative. And in fact, you can see the same story for the next phase line too. Okay, if we go down to where those two equilibrium on the left coincided, we're now going to have positive, positive, negative. So that's positive, positive, negative. So we have a node on the bottom and a sink on the top. And then we slide down a little bit more and we just have positive for y values below the equilibrium to the left of our root and negative for y values which are large and positive. Okay, let me clean up this picture on the right now. Let's draw a bifurcation curve. It's gonna look kind of like a tilted S. It shouldn't be like a hard angle right there. It should be kind of curvy like this. Okay, so it takes this shape. I think what I will do is copy it over Okay, let me get rid of most of these dashed lines. It's just a little bit much to see. And then let me re-highlight the two nodes that we had there. Okay, the bottom of this S, this part here, this is a branch of sinks. Similarly, the top of the S is also a branch of sinks. The middle part is a short branch of sources. This is called a fold bifurcation. It's kind of like we have two saddle node bifurcations if you just look around those two nodes. So for negative values of mu, we just have a sink. Then out of nowhere, we get a node up at a higher value of y. That node splits into a sink and a source. But then as we keep traveling left to right, the source and the bottom sink meet each other and then disappear. We will actually see this exact bifurcation curve when we look at the energy balance model for planet Earth. The main thing to keep in mind with this full bifurcation is that in the middle there, we have two steady state possibilities. So if Y is high, there's a steady state up there. And if Y is low, there's a steady state down there. So they're kind of dueling steady state possibilities for a solution y to this differential equation.